Dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service uh, and welcome this afternoon to a conversation with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, author of this new book, Speaking for Myself. Sarah served as White House Press Secretary from 2017 to 2019. Uh, in that role and in uh, her post White House role, she has been an ardent defender of President Trump and also a lightning rod for President Trump, uh, both drawing strong emotions. She's back in Arkansas. Uh, she is a member of the Fulbright Scholarship Board. She and her husband, Brian, uh, have started a nonprofit, uh, Arkansas 30 Day Fund, uh, for, to help uh, small businesses in the state who have been impacted by COVID. Actually, uh, I'm gonna quit calling him Brian. I'm gonna call him K1 from this point on because that's the way he was identified in Sarah's book. So he becomes K1. But this 30 day fund has already helped a lot of small businesses. And in addition to that, she's back here. She's uh, speaking out. She's uh, gonna be on a book tour and. And she's also giving some thought about running for governor in 2022. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, at some point today. So please welcome Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Thank you, Skip. Always good to be with you. Such an honor. Um, we've known each other a long time and uh, first met, I think, when I was uh, walking the halls of Central High and in school with uh, your daughters. And so been a long friendship and I really appreciate you having me on tonight. Well, well thanks for being with us. Tell us a little bit about your book. When did you decide to write it uh, and how did you decide what not to include in it? <laughs> Um, well, I, shortly after I left the White House, I had a few people approach me about writing a book and talking about both my experience in the White House um, and also growing up in a political family and some of my background. And, you know, there have been so many books written about the Trump White House that I hesitated for a minute. Do we, do we need another uh, book about the Trump White House? However, I thought I had a very unique perspective. Most of the books that had been written um, weren't exactly friendly. And I was an actual insider. I spent two and a half years working in the White House and almost every day of those two and a half years, either with or talking to the president and felt like I had a very different side and a very different vision of Donald Trump that I wanted the rest of America to see. And that was sort of the catalyst for wanting to write the book, but also wanting people to understand a bit more about who I am, how I became the press secretary and um, my background. And ideally people will enjoy reading the book as much as I enjoyed writing it. I hope they laugh a little, cry a little, and maybe are even inspired a little by some of the stories and the moments uh, that I walk through in the book. Well, uh, I have finished reading it and I've got a lot of questions uh, about it uh, to ask you, but first let me start by saying you were the third woman to be White House press secretary and the first mom to be White House press secretary. You also were the first press secretary to my knowledge to have a president who tweeted early, late, and often. <laughs> And you write about in the book about some days uh, that your total agenda is changed because of the tweets. I want you to talk about the president as tweeter in chief <laughs> and also about, did you ever say to him, did you ever go to him and say, Mr. President, I really wish you wouldn't tweet about this. Um, absolutely. There were, there were certainly moments um, the president and I would talk about a tweet and I would suggest that maybe that wasn't the best tweet ever. And sometimes he listened, sometimes he didn't. Um, at the end of the day, even though some of the tweets made my job a bit more challenging and I would wake up in the morning at 5 a.m. and think that the news cycle would be driven by one thing and by 6.30, the president could completely flip that upside down and we would be talking about something totally different. So there were certainly challenges with it, but I also think um, one of the reasons that 
Donald Trump won in 2016. And one of the reasons that people still like him today, and he has such an enthusiastic base of support, is because they like that he's unconventional. They like that at any given moment, they know what he's thinking, what he's doing, and where he is on a number of topics. I think a lot of people find it refreshing, even if it made my job as press secretary a bit more challenging at times. So he changed the way communications took place uh, in, in a big way. You had you look at history, you look at FDR's fireside chats, you look at the Kennedy-Nixon debate, you look at the emergence of the internet, but Twitter became President Trump's direct contact with his base and with his with his voters. Um, do, does he write all his tweets? Does uh, some people ghost write some for him? Um, most all of his tweets are original tweets. Certainly he's got a few retweets out there, but there's also moments where suggestions are made um, from a particular agency or something specific going on in the administration that we want to highlight. Um, and he has the ability to get that information out quickly and unfiltered uh, to the masses very fast. And I think that Twitter has been an important tool for the president um, to be able to do that, to get that message out, whatever it may be, in a way that he gets to put it in his own words without any media spin or anything else on it, which for this president, I think has been very important. You know, I think when they, when historians go back and look at the Trump presidency, um, those tweets are going to be primary source uh, resource research material. I mean, he, he, I, I think the Library of Congress is, is collecting every one of them. So uh, some biographer down the road years, I mean, those tweets are going to be valuable, whether you agree or disagree with them. The fact that he was communicating, and as you said, unfiltered. Absolutely, and, and they do all have to be archived. In fact, everybody um, that works at the White House through their official account, all tweets have to be archived, um, which was a bit of a challenge coming in and a, and a new process for somebody who um, used social media so frequently, and they had to develop a, a couple new systems to make sure they didn't miss anything. But that's certainly, I think, going to be a pretty big task for whoever is assigned uh, yeah. to go through each of those tweets and match it up with everything else that was happening in the world at those as they went out in, in real time. You write in the book uh, that while he supported you and, 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 and oftentimes praised you, uh, that he was at times difficult to work for, uh, that at times he, uh, he used uh, strong language in, in, in responding to you. Can you talk about your personal interactions with him? Did you, uh, did you ever find it in a situation where you just um, had trouble communicating with him? And was there anything about him, uh, if you could change one thing about that, what, what would that be? I mean. Uh, that's just, I think it's real interesting because you obviously had um, insight and connection and access um, probably more than maybe any one individual in the White House, exception of Chief of Staff, maybe or something. Yeah, I, have a, I had a great relationship with the president um, and still do today. And I think one of the things that the president understood, um, despite the fact he was usually battling with the press, he still understood the power of the press. And he knew it would be impossible for me to effectively do my job if I didn't know where he was on any given topic at any given time. Um, my job was to speak on his behalf in that role. And so to be able to communicate his message and his agenda, I had to be really in tune with what that was. And because of that, he included me in everything took me uh, to those meetings and make sure made sure I wasn't getting information third hand but I was part of the conversation part of that process so that it made it much easier to communicate that message if he hadn't done that I think it would have been impossible for me to really speak on his behalf um, certainly there are moments that were difficult 
And when you're working in a 24 seven, all consuming high stress job, um, you know, there are going to be moments that there's, there's tension and um, certainly pushback. There were times I disagreed with the president. We would have those conversations and he would listen. Uh, sometimes I had the ability to influence his decision. And sometimes, you know, his mind was set and he was going to move forward. So I felt like it was important that I did that in private. And I think that that is how it's supposed to operate. And I always appreciated he was never unwilling to listen to anything I had to say. and because I had a good relationship, I was able to be very candid with him. And he was the same way with me. And I wouldn't have wanted it any differently. I wouldn't have wanted him to treat me um, as a woman any differently than he treated any other staffer. And I appreciated that it was always an even playing field. And um, again, had a great relationship. And I think in large part, because we both had the ability to speak candidly with one another. Well, you have me. We have to admit that he uh, he's certainly unique uh, uh, and, and different, and and I think it's fair to say, uh, in some cases, polarizing. Um, so, you write about you mentioned it when we talked uh, in the introduction uh, when we uh, met uh, when you were a student at Central High School, and I still remember that day um, in 1997 on the 40th anniversary of the. 57 crisis, when your dad, the governor, uh, President Clinton, and Mayor Jim Daly held the doors of Central High School open uh, for the Little Rock Nine. And you you write that it, it helped you accept the differences uh, uh, of others uh, and note that there's still much work to be done uh, to close the racial divide in America. I say that, Sarah, knowing your strong views, and I remember you as a student, uh, and I appreciated your support of the 40th anniversary. But, but President Trump has a history. Um, the Nixon Justice Department uh, investigated him about not renting to blacks. He, he called for the execution of the Central Park Five and they were innocent. He, he jumped all over those rumors, hateful rumors about Barack Obama and Kamala Harris uh, whether they were born, their birthism issues. And then, you know, he said about the white supremacists, some of the white supremacists in Charlottesville, there's some good people in that group. What, what we saw in Charlottesville and was the closest thing we've seen since the mobs at Little Rock Central High School. Equate your personal views and what you've written about race with his actions. Well, I, I think, Skip, to, to be very frank, some of those uh, things are taken a little bit out of context, but I think look at what President Trump has done as president in those just few short years uh, since taking office. I mean, I think arguably he has done more for the black community than Joe Biden did in 47 years. He has uh, fought for historic funding and secured historic funding for HBCUs and made that permanent. He created opportunity zones, which create resources uh, for minority specific communities and help provide them uh, financial help to, to really, I think, grow and prosper. He has put in, I think, criminal justice reform will be one of the biggest legacies of this president. And that had been attempted for a long time and never been able to be accomplished until Donald Trump came and essentially single-handedly pushed that through, which had disproportionately hurt the black community. I think that is gonna be, again, a signature thing for this president. Um, historic low unemployment, not just for African-Americans, but Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, he has done things that have lifted all Americans, and I think his policies have been good for every American. So I, I think people have to really look at what this president has done. He was also one of the first people in the Palm Beach area and the Florida area in his private clubs to allow uh, Blacks and Jewish members, uh, something that was unprecedented at the time. He has given money and raised money and received awards for efforts that he has made within the Black community long before he was running for president and had a lot of good relationships with members 
members of the black community until he announced that he was running for president as a Republican. And so I think you have to, we can't just cherry pick a couple of things and take those. You have to look at the whole of things he's done and particularly what he has done as president and how he has, I think, impacted the black community in a very positive way. You, you, you raised some points about some policies that he has um, instituted. And, um, and I agree with you on criminal justice reform. It was long overdue. And, and I think that that's fair. But Sarah, he referred to countries as S-hole countries. Uh, you, you even, and we'll talk about Bob Woodward here in a minute, but you know, it, it comes back up in the Bob Woodward book. Uh, I mean, I understand the defense of his policies, but taking out full page ads calling for the execution of the Central Park Five, of, uh, I mean, I, 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 there, there's a big difference between Donald Trump's professional, at least some of his accomplishments, and his what he's done personally. And I, that's where I have trouble because you write very clear in the book, and I, I appreciate your comments and what you say about about race in the book in Central High School. But I think there's a big difference between the personal Donald Trump and what we see and some of the policies that he has at least attempted um, to, to, to get through. Well, I, I, can, I can speak from my personal experience having spent um, a year on the campaign and two and a half years traveling around the, the country and frankly the world with the president. Um, I, I can tell you that he is somebody who loves this country, loves the people of this country, all of the people, and is fighting to do good things for every American. And I saw that firsthand on a number of occasions where he really looked for ways to empower um, all different communities within the country. And so uh, I point you back to those moments of what I think he has accomplished things that he has done to really empower different minority groups in the country. And I, again, I point back to my own personal experience and what I saw firsthand from this president and what I witnessed every day with his interaction of people from all walks of life. And he couldn't have been more supportive of the variety of people that he encountered on a daily basis. So you think the criticism when people say Donald Trump is a racist, you think that's unfair criticism? I think it's unfair criticism. That doesn't mean uh, I agree with every comment ever made, but I think who Donald Trump is at his core, I, d I don't agree with that characterization. And for me personally, because you brought up Central, um, that was a very pivotal moment um, in my life. And I will never forget, and it wasn't just in that moment, the 40th anniversary at Central. And to give a little bit of background, I was a sophomore at Central High at that time, and we were celebrating 40 years after uh, the Little Rock Nine had entered those doors. And it was pretty remarkable to think and to stand on those front steps at Central where all nine of the Little Rock Nine were still living and had the doors opened by the president, the governor, and the mayor instead of shut in their faces. And then fast forward to my senior year at Central High, and it was a tradition at our school to host a senior breakfast. And typically there were a lot of different groups. Every friend group had their own breakfast. In my senior year, we joined together uh, with the entire class and went to the governor's mansion. Uh, we had a little bit of an inside scoop there to get a spot. And my dad was governor at the time and we hosted a senior breakfast for our entire senior class in the very uh, location that the person who stopped those Little Rock Nine from entering the building had once occupied. And for me to see that transition and to see how far we had come, I think was um, very impactful even as a teenager and something I've carried with me. And that doesn't mean that we don't still have work to do. We certainly do, but I do think it was monumental in where we had been to where we are now. Um, and I hope that we'll continue to aggressively push for that path of progress in the same way we did even when I was a, a junior and senior in high school. Well, you may uh, you may have the opportunity in, in 2021 and 2022 to uh, talk more about that. And we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Uh, did you know that, did you know uh, President Trump was talking with Bob Woodward? 
Um, I had heard that he was going to, but I had already left the White House by the time that those uh, interviews had started. So explain to me, explain to me, and again, I understand uh, how, how things work. Have, have you been around that a little bit? But explain to me, he clearly reached out to Woodward. He clearly let Woodward tape him. Uh, explain to me, at least from your knowledge of the president, sort of the background on that, because, um, uh, I mean, he is quoted on, on the tape saying some pretty uh, challenging things. You know, I think when Bob Woodward wrote the first book, the president didn't participate, and um, it was a pretty nasty account of the Trump administration, and it was full of a lot of anonymous sources. I think the president was hopeful that if he injected his own voice into the story, um, that it might have a better, a bigger impact and a more positive result. Uh, I know that past presidents have tried the same thing and usually all with very little success. I don't think any of the presidents that have participated have been very happy with the outcome of the Bob Woodward book, uh, President Bush included. And so um, maybe at some point they'll stop doing interviews with Bob Woodward. I don't know. I don't think I would recommend whoever follows next if it's not Donald Trump in the next four years to do an interview with Bob Woodward because I don't think it turns out very well. Uh, what I do think is refreshing though about the president is he is willing to take tough questions. He's not afraid to answer questions from reporters on the daily basis um, he does that in the Oval Office, in the briefing room, on the White House lawn. He is constantly accessible to the press uh, in a way that, frankly, I don't think we've ever seen in history any president interact with the press as frequently as this president does. In terms of some of the things, I, I haven't read the book and I haven't seen it. I know one of the big stories, obviously, is about the president's response to the coronavirus. Um, I find it very interesting that one of the people that Democrats and the liberal media have really leaned on in this process is Dr. Fauci. And Dr. Fauci came out over the last 24 hours and said that he didn't see any inconsistencies and that President Trump had listened to them and done uh, what he thought they should have. And now all of a sudden, nobody's talking about what Dr. Fauci is saying. Um, Donald Trump didn't want to create panic. He didn't want to collapse the economy, but he did take it seriously. That's why when Democrats were focused on impeaching the president, he was actually implementing the China travel ban and they were attacking him for doing so, something that likely saved thousands, if not even more American lives. Well, and I, and I saw the Fauci comments too. And Fauci basically uh, said, he was quoted based on what someone else had said. But Donald Trump was quoted directly. And, and basically, he knew the virus was airborne. He knew it was deadly. He knew it was dangerous. And he sat back and didn't let the American people know. Now, that would be like, Sarah, if we're in New Orleans and there's a Category 5 hurricane coming and we don't warn the people. Now, panic is one thing, but 190,000 plus people have died during the Trump presidency for, from coronavirus. And I'm not saying he caused coronavirus. What I'm saying is he knew and admitted how serious it was and didn't act. Well, I don't think it's fair to say that he didn't act because he did. I think if he hadn't taken some of those precautionary steps that he was criticized for, it would have been infinitely worse. Not only did he put in place travel bans, but he also mobilized and cut government red tape out of the way so individual companies could start producing uh, much needed supplies and inventory, whether it was ventilators or PPE gear. Let's also not forget, uh, well after the president made those comments, Joe Biden also said, let's not create panic. Let's not have hysteria. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was walking through the streets of Chinatown uh, telling everybody that things were fine and Donald Trump was wrong uh, to make the travel ban and institute that he did. Donald Trump actually brought up coronavirus in his State of the Union address in January and 
not long after that, Democrats were still attacking him. Uh, the Washington Post ran stories and headlines saying nothing more than a seasonal flu, nothing to be worried about. So the idea that he, one, wasn't taking action, I don't think is a fair criticism. And two, um, his rhetoric wasn't different than a lot of the other individuals that are now attacking this president. Well, and I, you know, I, again, we can we can agree to disagree, uh, which 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 is not un uncommon. That's okay. Which is what you and I are are very capable. We of doing. we are very capable of doing that, and and uh, that's that's perfectly fine. But Sarah, look, I mean, he's he, he's he's, we know now masks work. He says yes for a mask, and he tells a reporter to take off a mask. He goes to major events, and people aren't wearing masks. I mean, he's not setting the example uh, of a unifier of a, of, this virus is going to be around until there is a vaccine and until a whole bunch of people take it. Um, but in the meantime, don't you think he should be setting a more uh, uh, unifying, what we've got against this virus, what, what we know works is fiscal distancing and masks. We know that we know they work. It, it's not the cure of the virus, but it gives us time to cure the virus. Don't you think he should be setting a better example than he is? Well, I, I think the president has been leading on this. Again, he took early action. Um, he has encouraged people to follow social distancing guidelines. At the same time, while we absolutely have to do everything we can to protect American lives, we have to also protect American livelihoods. We cannot allow um, our entire country to collapse um, in the process. And I think the president has um, faced an unprecedented challenge and tried to find that right balance of making sure we are putting an emphasis on protecting individual Americans, but also protecting um, individual Americans' livelihoods. So many people are struggling with a variety of other challenges related to COVID, whether it's depression, job loss, uh, child care. There are a lot of different components and we can't just single out one piece of it. And I think the president has tried to take action and find that right balance. I think the reason that you saw so many Democrats like Gavin Newsom and Andrew Cuomo originally praising the president is because he took that quick action and provided them with the resources they needed. Um, I think the president has done the best he can under those circumstances with a very difficult situation and trying to find a good balance. Well, and and, and I appreciate your comments. And again, we'll, we'll agree to disagree that the, the, the the poll numbers on the president's response to coronavirus are, are dismal. Um, but let's move on to the area where you've been out there. Uh, uh, and I've seen you on television. Uh, you've been out there. Uh, and I want to know how you got engaged. And that was uh, the Atlantic Magazine story of President Trump uh, and his uh, reference to uh, the military being losers and then followed up by the generals uh, trying to benefit the defense contractors. And, I, and I'm out there and here is Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying, I was there. He didn't say that. Uh, but you're now a contributor at Fox News and I've watched you on that. You do a great job, by the way. Not that I agree with your positions, but you handle yourself very well. Um, but, but Fox News has confirmed this story. So, so, it, you know, what's the defense? Well, I think it's really simple. They probably confirmed it with the same anonymous sources that started the rumor in the first place. You have an anonymous source up against on record statements from 12 people. I was in the room. Uh, I'm not afraid to go on the record. I think it's cowardly to make an accusation like that and not put your name to it. Um, I was standing there when the two discussions around the president's travel took place and I know he didn't say those things. I also have spent um, hours and hours traveling with the president to military bases, interacting with members of our armed forces every single day. And I've witnessed a president who has a great deal of respect for the men and women of our military. I watched the president reach up and touch the face of a veteran who had lost his arms because he wanted him to feel human contact. 
I watched the president and traveled with him on Christmas night in December of 2018, of which I write extensively about in my book, uh, to surprise the troops and go around to each individual table to thank them for their service along with the first lady. Um, I've seen instance after instance of this president, both publicly and privately showing respect uh, for the men and women of our military. The day after that alleged incident, um, the president stood in the rain for more than an hour giving a speech um, at a cemetery to remember and honor the veterans from our country. And so the idea that he somehow um, was afraid to mess up his hair is just, to me, pretty absurd. And it just didn't happen on that day. Well, but, but couldn't it have happened in other conversations that you weren't present? I mean, the president talks to a lot of people and you're not with him 24 seven. So couldn't that have happened in other conversations? Well, the account and the story they're making is from a conversation I was present for. So I can speak specifically to the charge that they made. And again, I'm willing to go on the record um, and dispute the claim other and and the anonymous source i again i think is a a coward for if you're going to make a charge like that i think you should put your name on it and back that up uh by doing so well do you think deep throat and watergate was a coward <laughs> well i i'm speaking to this specific instance um well, I, I, have I mean there are anonymous sources have been around for a long time I, and personally, as somebody who had to deal with anonymous sources on the daily basis, I think a charge like that, um, without putting your name on it, I do think is a cowardly act. And do you think you know who they are? Uh, I have guesses, but I, I'm not 100%. And you don't want to speculate, do you? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not going to accuse somebody of something. I, I don't think that's a fair thing to do without knowing 100% who it is. That's fair. Okay. Uh, one of the things you write in your book is uh, that one of the worst problems in the media today is the, uh, the lack of separation between news and opinion. Uh, and now as a contributor for Fox News, do you think uh, that is anything new? Do you think the separation, but uh, the, the, the wall is, is uh, between the news side, the editorial side, uh, is, is torn down? Or do you think that's, uh, and do you think it's more than just television? I, I don't think it's new, but I do think it has expanded exponentially um, over the last decade, not even just within this White House, um, but certainly over the last 10 years. I think a lot of that has to do with social media um, and so many people getting information digitally and not just from the news. It also has to do with the growth of the cable news industry. Look, there are people on um, both the right and the left that are commentators that are part of the news apparatus. I write about this in the book. I mentioned Sean Hannity specifically on the right. He's not a news guy, he's a commentator. He doesn't try to pretend to be a news person. Um, he's there to offer his opinions. There is nothing wrong with that. Rachel Maddow on the left does the same thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when you don't know the difference and when the lines get so blurred and news reporters are injecting their own bias and their own opinions into their stories, I do think there's a problem with that. Um, and they also have to have separation even if their story may contain only news, but then you go to their Twitter feed, that is a public Twitter feed, and it has tweet after tweet after tweet uh, showing you exactly where they are on a particular topic. It's very hard to separate that. And I think we need to have more clear lines of what is news and what is opinion. I think they're both important. I think they both play a role, but I think it would be better if there was greater separation. And I, that goes for the left and the right. So the Washington Post has said, has kept a list and said that they have a list of 20,000 false statements that President Trump has made. Is that news or opinion? Well, I think a lot of it is their opinion because a lot of the things that they claim are false are the way that they like to spin things up. I had that happen to me on a number of occasions. One of the things that I think that they like to do when they can't win the argument or they don't like the message, they attack it. Um, I think this is something that liberals do constantly. I've lived through it myself, and it, I, 
I find it to be very disturbing that if they disagree or they don't like the message, it all of a sudden means you're a liar if they can't beat you on the message. Well, and I think people on the left would say the same thing about people on the right. So, I think, so. as you call out the liberals, I think people on the other side would, would say the same thing. Uh, so, give me an example of where you think new where someone who is opinion but is passing off as news well it's it's less about one individual um on in one instance but i think if you look at uh, again a lot of the white house reporters that i worked with every single day you can read one of their stories i think personally they lean a little to the left a lot of the time but go look at their social media pages and see if they are constantly retweeting negative stories and um you know the breakdown of their opinion they comment and put constant commentary out there i think if you look at those um it's it's really hard to separate one of the other things that uh and facts that i noticed particularly during my time as the White House press secretary is on average over 90% of the news media coverage around the president is negative. Despite the fact we had a booming economy, despite the fact we were rebuilding the military, defeating ISIS, wiping dangerous terrorists off the face of the planet. There were a lot of positive things, even if you disagreed um, with most of the president's policies. The idea um, that you couldn't find any good news to talk about in our country, despite the fact it was doing so well, I think is very telling to how far to the left the media has moved, particularly um, over the last several years. Well, I think you could come back and I think anybody that's had your position in, in previous administrations, Republican and Democrat, would say uh, the media is not your friend. I no. think people would, I think, I think, I think there's always and I've seen it in different administrations, and you've seen it when you've heard from different press secretaries, that there is this uh, sort of adversarial relationship uh, between uh, upstairs at the White House and downstairs at the White House. Uh, and so I, I don't think that's totally uh, uh, just about President Trump. I think, I mean, I, you, you could argue that and you make the case for it. But I think press secretaries for uh, in modern day presidencies where the where the press corps is right downstairs and where, as you write, they have access to your office most any time they want it or had access to your office most any time they want it. So, uh, all right, let now let I want to pivot uh, because I all your national interviews and you're and you're going to go on this national book tour and you're going to get a lot of these national questions. But let's talk Arkansas. Okay. Let's let's talk first about the Fulbright Board, and what do you see uh, your role in expanding uh, the international scholarship opportunities? What do you what do you see about that? Well, I, I think the Fulbright program is very unique in the sense that it allows us to develop relationships with people all over the world, a form of soft diplomacy. Um, a lot of these people are the elite in their field, and it allows the United States government to develop those relationships with people who are going to be leaders in their industries um, at a, a very pivotal time. We provide those resources um, and develop great partnerships with people that will likely have um, influence and power. And again, it's a great relationship tool. It also um, allows us to, I think, help people excel in specific areas of their field. And a really special thing since it was, you know, named after a senator from here in Arkansas to get to be a part of. So you were on Marine One when President Trump, out of the blue, asked you a question, <laughs> are you running for governor? Uh, were you surprised when he asked that? Had you given any hint to anybody before that? Uh, tell us about that particular moment. 
I was definitely caught off guard um, that that came from the president. I found out later, and I won't say who, but the president had talked to somebody from Arkansas within the last 24 hours. And I think that the idea came maybe from that conversation, but it definitely was the first time he and I had ever talked about it. And I was surprised um, by his question. And, um, you know, the conversation kind of continued from there. And he, he brought it up on multiple fronts uh, following that first conversation. So hypothetically, uh, <laughs> what's your vision for Arkansas? Well, hypoth clearly hypothetical. Um, right now, my focus is on 2020. I want to help the president get reelected. I'd like to see Republicans maintain the Senate um, and take over the majority in the House. But if, um, regardless of whether or not I run for office in Arkansas, this is my home. This is where I want to raise my kids. Um, the only times I've moved away from this state were to serve in two presidential administrations. And as soon as my work was done, I came back home because I love the state and I love the people here. I think that Arkansas um, is an incredible place with a lot of potential areas that I think that we have done well, but could do a lot better. Economic development, education has to be a top priority, not just for Arkansas, but nationally, we have to do better as a country. Arkansas is no longer just competing with people from Texas and Mississippi and Oklahoma. We're competing with students from Japan and China. We are now competing in a global economy and we have to prepare our students for that. And I think we can do um, some new things and grow with the times to, to really do that and, and expand our education and our opportunities in the state. Those kind of go hand in hand with economic development and workforce development. We have to do better on all of those fronts. Um, and those are things, again, whether I run for office or not, areas I want to be involved in and help on uh, to move our state forward. So are you going to get uh, Hogan Gidley and Judd Deer back to help you? Um, I, I hope they come back to Arkansas, regardless of what I do. Um, they're great friends and very smart, talented, capable people. And I'd love for them to, to come back to Arkansas, even if I just got to see them more often, it would make me happy. Okay, I want to know, what does K-1 think about this? <laughs> Um, so for those who don't know, K-1 is my husband. Um, he's from Kansas and uh, we met during my dad's presidential campaign and there were two guys that came in from Kansas and so they were quickly nicknamed K-1 and K-2. In fact, I think Brian may still be in my mom's phone as K-1 uh, and, and has been for, for the last decade plus. But Brian um, is the best partner and husband I could ever ask for. And he has put up with me for the last 10 years on every adventure that we've been on. And um, no decision I make will be without his full support. And I'm just happy that he's stuck by my side so far for everything that we've been through and have three great kids. And I wouldn't want to do life with anybody else. And he's a pretty good political strategist too. That doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. So what does the, uh, the, the, the former governor uh, who uh, uh, happens to be your father, what, is, what, what does he think? Uh, look, my, my dad is proud no matter what I do. He was proud uh, as for me to be the White House press secretary. He's proud for me to just be the mom of his grandkids too. So uh, more than anything, I think my dad's biggest concern and my mom's biggest concern is making sure they get plenty of grandparent time. Uh, I used to think I was a pretty big deal and pretty special to my parents and then I had kids and now I realize that I don't matter anymore and it's all about the grandkids. Well people are already lining up for 2022 and I know you're uh, you're not uh, you want to get through 2020 you don't have much longer to wait um, but people are already lining up and some of your friends are already uh, running for governor. Um, when do you anticipate making a decision? Again, sometime after the 2020 election, I think our focus right now, um, both as Republicans, but also uh, people who care about the future of our country, I think we need to be focused on the election in front of us instead of jumping ahead to the next one. So my focus is where I think it should be, 2020, and I'll make a decision sometime after that. And what will, what will be your, you know, decision making? What's going to, what, 
what do you think would be the factors that would put you in the race or out of the race? What, what, what are those factors going to be? Well, I, I think the, the most important thing is feeling like I've been called to that place. Uh, I'm a very devout Christian and believer and following the path that God lays for us. And um, I've tried to do that in each decision I've made professionally as well as personally. And so I'll spend a lot of time with my family and, um, you know, determine whether or not we feel like we're being called to, to make that jump. And um, that'll be a huge part of that decision. And also whether or not I'm the right person at the right time to lead our state in the way that it needs to be done. And those will be sort of the catalyst and the big pieces that we'll make a decision based on those. So things. do you think I might have an answer by January, 2021? <laughs> I don't know, Skip, are you gonna come out and help me if I do? Listen, I, <laughs> can I, can I, I move you from the other side and, and when you when are. I, hey, when I became dean of the Clinton School, I left politics at the door. I haven't been involved in a partisan campaign since 2006. That might have been your smartest decision, decision ever. It uh, lets you have a little bit more uh, freedom to do it, pretty much whatever you want. I, I think in retrospect, you, you may be right. Um, <laughs> Okay, we're gonna. We, I know you. You've got other events to go. Other thing, but I want to ask you one final question. Your best day in the White House. Your worst day. Oh, that's that's a good one, Skip. Um, probably my worst day, and um, I had a few that were pretty challenging and very difficult. But I think the most difficult day was one of the conversations that, um, and one of the moments right after the Las Vegas shooting. And knowing that I had to be the first voice from the administration to go out and speak to a country that was hurting, a country that was grieving, and figuring out how to find words um, to do that was extremely difficult um, and very emotional and very trying, not just for me, but for our team, for the entire administration, and certainly for the country. And being the first person to respond to that um, and wanting to comfort a country that was hurting in the way it was, was probably one of not just the more challenging moments in the White House, but probably one of the more challenging moments I've ever experienced. Uh, what, about, what about your best day? Now, my best day um, might have been the very first. Um, and in part, there were certainly other moments that were maybe more exciting or more historical or more monumental, but walking in to the West Wing of the White House for the very first time as a staffer for the president is a pretty remarkable feeling. And I really tried to take a minute to take it all in and remember that moment and remember that feeling. And I constantly would sort of tell myself uh, and talk to Brian about, but also internalize that I never wanted to walk into that building and not have a sense of reverence and a sense of respect um, for the responsibility and the privilege I had for working there. And that was something that was really important to me. But that first day was something uh, certainly you only get to do it one time. You never get it again. And it was really special to step through that door for the very first day. Well, I want to thank you, Sarah, for taking time for your busy schedule to, to visit with us today. Uh, your book, uh, people can uh, pick up signed copies at Wordsworth Books, which partners with the Clinton School on, on, on our program. So if people want to read this book, and uh, please go by Wordsworth and get one. Sarah, good luck to you. I hope, uh, I hope when, we, when we talk again, you can uh, uh, give me more information about your potential candidacy for governor. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's always an honor to be with you, Skip. Thank you.